welcome back to this channel where we spread love and positive vibes by the way guys karibuni sana means welcome so much and i want to start by thanking our new subscribers and our returning subscribers we really appreciate you we thank you so much for joining us and for liking our videos and following for following us we do not take it for granted and thank you so much once again today i wanted to capture uh, two things but i'm going to start with the one of the things that i wanted to talk about today about jamaica shocking the world and i want to start by saying i always keep on repeating that jamaica is a small island but they tawala they is it tawala or talawa something like that so they are a small island but they read the world and others follow i actually got shocked to learn some of the great achievements that Jamaicans have achieved. It could be a small island with very few people, a very small population, but it has achieved so much that has not been achieved by great nations, great countries, developed countries all over the world. They have actually shocked us by their size, their achievement, and the population of the island. And I'll start by saying it is because of work hard, working hard, and also the ability to fight. I talked about the fighting spirit of the Jamaican people. They do not relent. They fight until they win. And I also talked about the winning, uh, is it the winning spirit? Yeah, the winning spirit of the people of Jamaica. They never quit. They never say die. They'll keep on pushing, pushing, pushing until they win. And we can see this clearly by the great achievement that have been achieved by Jamaica all over the world and they have actually shocked the world. People keep on telling, uh, asking, why is Jamaica so popular? Why do they keep on talking about their food? Why are they always talking about themselves? Because Jamaica is a very tiny island and people have actually conquered to be winners in so many areas. And when you win, when you don't even actually let me put it nicely, when you win, like Usain Bolt said, when you win, you have to celebrate. You have to let the whole world know. You have to shout on top of your on top of the world and tell the world that you have won. And that is what Jamaicans have done. They always talk about their wins. They always talk about what they have conquered. They always talk about their beautiful island. And that is why we appreciate them. By the way, guys, I came to know Jamaica when I was very, very young. And the reason why I came to know Jamaica is because of the reggae music and the Rastafarian movement. To speak the truth, I thought everybody in Jamaica is a Rastafarian because people come to appreciate the deeds, the talent that others have. So when I was a little girl, I came to know Jamaica because of the reggae music, Bob Marley, everybody knows Bob Marley, everybody talks about the reggae music, Everybody talks about the Rastafarian style. Everybody talks about the Rastafarian movement. And we came to know Jamaica because of this. I later came to know Jamaica because of the fastest runners in the world. So because of this conquering, people have come to know Jamaica and appreciate them and actually love them. And that is why people keep on asking us, why do you always talk about Jamaica? Why don't you talk about this island and this island? Because Jamaicans have talked about their country. They have made us to know them and appreciate them. We have come to know so much about their culture. And therefore, that is what we talk about. The other countries, we have not known much about them because they don't talk about themselves. It's like you tell me, in Kenya, why don't people know Kenya? Because maybe as Kenyans, we don't talk about our country just like Jamaicans talk about their country. 
and because Jamaica have actually brought their country to us, brought their culture to us, brought their music to us, brought their way of life to us, brought their athletics to us, then we have come to appreciate them and know them. I remember there is that time Usain Bolt came in Kenya and he went to the national park and he was praying aloud with a lion. And everybody in Kenya, all the news in Kenya were actually focusing on Usain Bolt and he's praying around with the lion and we came to appreciate him and to know him. So the good character, the social beat of people, the ability to do exploits is what makes people to know people and to appreciate them and to love them. Without further ado, let me go to some of the things that I've shown to the world about Jamaica. First of all, there are so many countries with very huge populations, with very huge landscape, with very huge abilities and resources, but they have not emerged winners in some of these areas. But Jamaica, as small as they are, they have emerged winners in most of the things that I'm going to mention today. Jamaica pioneered the fight to independence. There are so many countries in the world that were colonized. Actually, every country, especially Africa, all of us who are under colonial, uh, corona, under colonial rule. But we find that Jamaica fought way, way early against colonialization or colonial systems and colonial rules and they refused oppression, they refused discrimination, they refused all that and they were amongst the first English speaking countries to attain independence. This is not a small achievement for a small island like Jamaica. We cannot say that Jamaica fought the colonial masters because they are many or they had sophisticated weapons, but because of their determination, their love of their country, their hard work, they are resilient, they are not losing hope, they were able to conquer the colonial masters and send them away from their country. And this is a great achievement because Jamaicans taught the people all over the world that it is possible to be free. It's possible to actually be against the colonial masters and tell them enough is enough and tell them they have to release you and actually resist against them until they actually set you free. Most of the African countries were actually taught how to fight for their freedom by Jamaicans. Look at South Africa. The first pioneers of ant apartheid were Jamaicans. And many Jamaicans artists sang about or against apartheid. We have Peter Tosh, we have Michael, Bob Murray, sorry, we have Bob Murray, and we have other people that came handy to actually talk against oppression in South Africa and apartheid. Look at Marcus Galvey. A Jamaican who actually fought for the freedom of the people of Africa. And therefore South Africa, uh, thanks to Jamaica, they got free from apartheid because of the intervention of this small island we call Jamaica. Zimbabwe was assisted by Jamaican people to actually fight for freedom and attain independence. As Kenyans, one of the royals, Tumze Jomo Kenyatta, was actually a Jamaican. And they held our hearts until we attained freedom. They did a lot of great work in Africa to actually make sure that the Africans are set free and to set an example to Africans that they should resist oppression, they should resist discrimination, they should, should resist they are not being taken away by foreigners. And that is why Jamaicans are loved, because they taught us all things are possible. With a lot of hard work, with the determination and with the zeal, one can achieve their objective. I have talked about the Rastafarian movement. 
the Jamaicans were the pioneer of the Rastafarian movement that actually spread all over the world and actually made people aware of peace, unity, and love because that is what they preach. The Rastafarian movement came along with long dreads that are worn by so many people in the world. So we can actually say the Rastafarian movement preached about peace, preached about unity, preached about love, and brought about uh, the setting free of some of the nations in Africa. And it also brought about the dreads that are worn by so many people all over the world. The reggae music also, it is sung all over the world, and the Jamaicans were actually the pioneer, and even hip hop. Being the pioneer of these things, when they are small island, it is actually so shocking to the whole world. Because you don't expect such great men and women to come from a small island like Jamaica. It's like asking what is good that can come from Jamaica. And they have proved to us time and again there is something good, something sweet, something wonderful about the people of Jamaica. So, here in Kenya, we have a radio station called the Ghetto Radio. They play like a music, they wear Rastafarian, actually they wear Rastas, and they have the Rastafarian colors and the reggae carrots. And that shows us there is something that can come from Jamaica and spread to the whole world as small as Jamaicans are which is uh, actually a great achievement. Jamaica has also achieved a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. I have kept on in my video talking about the great achievements of Jamaica that have shocked the world. They hold the fastest runners in the whole world. They actually have a lot of gold medals, a lot of silver medals, a lot of bronze, and all over the world, Jamaicans are known to be the fastest people in the world. Actually, the, it is the home to the fastest man in the whole world, Usain Bolt. He actually set a record that has not been broken by anyone in the whole world. And this is a great achievement, having in mind that Usain Bolt came from a small village. And that is why I'm telling you, Jamaica have taught us that you can come from, uh, from your ashes to grace with determination, with a lot of hard work, with a lot of zeal, you can come from your, grace, from your glass to grace. And that is what we have seen with Jamaican people. Not mentioning the food. Their food is known all over the world. They have the best food. They cook by taking their time, by a lot of determination, a lot of wrath, and their food has come to be embraced by people all over the world. So they have actually told us it's possible to actually do something small and make a lot of impact outside there in the world. What about their coffee? The Blue Mountain Coffee. It is the coffee with the greatest quality. Jamaicans have a sense of excellence. The food they eat is excellent, their runners are excellent, their beauty queens are excellent, their fashion is excellent, their iron is excellent. What else? Can you continue naming what is excellent in Jamaica? Don't forget about the beer. They have the best red striped beer in the whole world. And it is known all over the world. So Jamaicans read and others follow. What about in innovations? What about in electricity? What about in railway? They are actually the pioneers of installation of electricity in their country and installation of water and the railway line. And I want to tell you, this is shocking to the world, not mentioning that Jamaica has produced some of the greatest people in the world, like Kamala Harris, like Powell, I've always mentioned them, like the great teachers that are awarded, the great 
police officers, the great men and women of Jamaica that are doing great outside there in the diaspora. We cannot take this country for granted. It is small, but it has done wonders. It is small, but it has broken the record. It is small, but it has taught the world all things are possible. That is Jamaica for you. The other part of this video, I wanted to talk about this couple. <laughs> you know, sometimes I watch some videos and I got a lot of inspiration. And uh, the teachers that I saw, that when you are willing to sacrifice, when you are willing to stand firm, when you are willing not to give up, all things can be possible. There is this couple that came from the United States of America and they came to Kenya as missionaries. They had come to preach the gospel. They had come to actually tell people about God and actually show people the way to love. And when they arrived in Kenya, they came with their daughter and I think their son. And when they arrived in Kenya, they went to the Nyanza. Is it, do we call it Lift Valley Eastern or Western County? Where Kisumu is. So they went to Kisumu and settled there as missionaries. And they started doing their missionary work. And the organization that had sent them had very, very strict rules about the work they were supposed to do in Kenya, about the missionary work, and about preaching the gospel without violating some of the rules they had put in place. One of the rules is that their daughters and their sons should not start falling in love with, with the, the people of Kenya and actually intermarry with the people of Kenya. Something like that. Maybe you listen to the clip of the video because I'm going to put it. And you listen to this couple parts and parts of uh, the video. I'm going to keep on putting the parts so that you can learn from them. So this couple, and you're going to hear their story. They came to Kenya as missionaries and they were supposed to settle in Kenya and preach the gospel and they settled and started preaching the gospel. Maybe I can put a clip here at this juncture uh, of them explaining how they came to Kenya and how they settled in Kisumu. After that I'll continue with the story. Well, hello my name is Gerald Miller and my wife Becky. I have a, a family in the U.S. We have three boys and two girls. Sylvia was our second daughter, and Sharon was our oldest daughter. She lives in Virginia. She has three daughters, and so we have three girls for granddaughters in the U.S. Hello, I'm Becky Miller. I am the wife to Gerald Miller, and... We've been missionaries here in Kenya. Uh, we lived in Kasumu for three years in 2016 to 2019. And so that's when we work with a mission called AMA Missions, Amish Mennonite Aid is the name of the mission. They've been here for many years. And we were called, we believe, from God to serve on that mission. So we lived in Kasumu. We had a church about an hour away from Kasumu uh, and so we had different churches we worked with different uh, churches in the area but we were focused on church planting so that was our mission with the work we did with the mission it was a very big uh, decision for us to make as a family to all come to Kenya our oldest daughter was married and her husband was a pastor in, in, in the U.S. But when we came here, we had our three sons, our daughter Sylvia and my wife and I, and we came as a family. So we, it was difficult. We left our American living. We left what we thought was our home. And I remember driving to Kenya and coming to Kasumu and the speed bumps and the potholes and the people, all the Africans, it intimidated us. How could a, a Musungu, an American, be in 
Kenya and be a pastor of a church. I was commissioned then to be a pastor from our church in the U.S. to come here and to teach the, the word of Jesus Christ to these people. And you know, I remember one of my pastors told me that I just want you to know. So you have heard how this couple came to Kenya. When they came to Kenya, I said they came with their daughter and I think a son. And they settled in Kenya and they started doing missionary work in Kenya. At one time, they were supposed to travel from Kisumu to Nairobi to do missionary. Uh, before then, uh, when they arrived in Kenya, and I'm going to, creep, to put a clip whereby this uh, couple is actually narrating the experience they had in Kenya. So when they arrived in Kenya, they settled somewhere in Kisumu, and after settling, this came to their house and stole some of their valuable items, like iPad, laptops, all that they were stolen from, and their hearts went down. Because they were asking themselves, we came to help the people of Kenya, and now it has turned against us, and everything has been stolen. So listen to this uh, couple as they narrate how their items were stolen here in Kenya. The, the Africans, we live right in Kasumu, so we live right in town. And the first week we were there, believe it or not, we got robbed. The thieves came in our house and stole my iPad, my camera, even my phone. So we, we were very disappointed that they was actually in our house and stole a lot of our things. So we felt God was telling us that we don't need all those things. We don't need all that. And so that started off in a difficult way that here we come to help the Kenya people and then they rob us. So that was for our, for our, for our three youth boys, that was very, very difficult, very difficult for me. But we worked through that and God gave us grace to go through that. It was a time in our life that we just gave it to. So guys, after the items were stolen, this couple's heart went down and they felt so, so bad. And one of the missionary they were working with promised them, I think promised them a laptop that this guy, the old man was supposed to use to do his work. And this laptop somewhere, somehow was not working well. So it was to be taken to a shop in Kisumu town for repair. And the father, uh, the daughter requested the father to accompany him uh, as they were going to take the laptop for repair. And she was talking about she was the father's girl and therefore the father could not deny her from uh, accompanying him to go and take the laptop for repair. And therefore they went to take the, rap, uh, the laptop for repair. And when they arrived where the laptop was being repaired, they met this dark, tall and handsome man from Kenya. And this girl immediately fell in love with this young man. And from now henceforth, they, they started communicating, meeting, I'm cutting the story short because I don't want to take a lot of time. So they started meeting and having a good time with this guy who was actually a Kenyan black man. And therefore they started talking and meeting and having a great time. But the father and the mother of this girl did not know that their daughter had met someone and they are actually talking. So actually let me put a clip where they are saying they took the laptop for repair and how this girl encountered or met the young man in the shop where the laptop was to be repaired. It's only my dad who woke up and opened the bedroom door and he saw the guy running past with our things and he sounded the alarm and they dropped my mom's pass on their way running and it had like her passport and ID and everything in it. So that's how I met him. He was not one of the thieves. But um, <laughs> one of the missionaries gave uh, my dad a laptop to replace the one that was stolen and it needed some repairs. 
So now that's where he came in. I, you know, just going to town was an adventure. So my dad said, I'm going to town to fix this laptop. And I asked him, can I just go with you? Like, I just want to see things and see how the people are doing their things. And he was like, sure, I was always a daddy's girl. So I went with my dad. We went to the place the missionaries told us. We always take our electronics to this place called New World in Kisumu. Go there with your laptop. So me and my dad went there. We went upstairs where they fix laptops and there he was. So you have heard the story how they met and how they fell in love and they started dating. Then this girl was sent to Nairobi for the missionary work. When she was in Nairobi, this boy or the fiancé kept on calling her and she kept on communicating with him. They were not supposed to enter with the phones where they were going through uh, the missionary work or the training. And therefore, after the training, she could find a lot of missed calls from this man and actually she could call back and they start talking. And there is a Kikuyu lady that saw her talking with a gentleman and she actually reported to the readers in the mission house that this girl is communicating with a, a, a Kenyan man and they were not supposed to actually date while doing the missionary work and therefore she knew she was if the, the, the father and the mother came to know and the readers of the missionary group came to know she was supposed to be deported back to her country and therefore she prayed that they don't know but for, unfortunately or fortunately, the readers of the missionary group in Nairobi visited Kisumu where this couple used to stay. And therefore the girl was told to tell the father or she faced these people telling the father. And therefore she requested them, uh, instead of them telling the father, she should be the one telling the father. So you can listen to the clip of her telling us how hard it was to actually open up and tell the father what is happening. Okay. You could only have your phone one hour of the day. So I would always use that one hour to call him. Oh, that one hour was like... Yeah. So I was there for 10 days. So during that 10 days, one of the girls from there, she's a Kikuyu. She is with the Maronite church there. And she just found out that I was talking to a man from Kisumu. Mm -hmm. So she told the pastors. And she was like, this Mazungu, she's talking to a Kenyan man. And this mission has been going for over 30 years. And there's never been a cross-cultural relationship. So um, the next time their pastors came to visit our pastors in our compound, I just knew I was going to be attacked. So after the meeting was over, I quickly went home. But imagine that pastor came to my house, him and his wife, and they were like, just come and talk to us. So we sat outside and they were like, we've been hearing, like you're talking with a man from Kisumu. You know, when you work for this mission, it's not allowed. You're being a bad example for our youth. We don't need youth like you here doing these kinds of things. Are you going to tell your parents or should we tell them? So I told them, let me just talk to my parents. So that's how they left. I panicked before my parents returned because the meeting was still ongoing. I just went, deleted his number, deleted all the messages, got rid of everything. Then when my parents came home, I just told them this is what happened. I'm talking to a guy in Kisumu. I have been for many months and I'm very sorry. I just delete his number. I deleted everything. I blocked him. Like I'm leaving him. Don't worry. I'm sorry for everything. I won't do it. Yeah. <clears throat> so they were very upset with me, but they were glad I had deleted his number and blocked him. It was fear because I knew if I continue, I can be sent home. So then I don't know if I'll ever see him again. So I just wanted to lay low 
and see what happens. So that's what I did for those two or three months. I just pretended I never met him, but I was hurting a lot. I was missing him because I could always go into my, I had my own bedroom, so I would go into my closet and I would place a blanket up over my head and I would close my door and place a fan there on a high setting. Then I would call him and we would talk until even three in the morning. So one day she said that she wanted to go have dinner with me. She wanted something. So after she told the father, you have watched what she's saying. After she told the father, she was told, now you have to choose because we are going to deny you the phone. You cannot communicate with this boy and you're going to be kept indoor, indoors. So she was kept indoors for a very long time until she pleaded with the parents, why don't you let me go back to America because you are keeping me in the house. I'm not doing the missionary work. I'm not meeting this guy. So I better go back to America. And she was told she was to go back to America. And uh, she requested the parent to see the boy for the last time to say bye-bye to him. So she was allowed to go and say bye-bye to this black guy. And they said they promised each other to actually wait for each other for one year. And therefore she departed and went to U.S. And while she was in U.S., she kept on communicating with this guy. To cut the wrong story short, they later came back, met with the parents, together with the parents to the girl, and the parents to the girl allowed this girl to marry the black guy, but she says that the first time the parents came to know, it's like a, they, there was death in the family. Everybody was crying. The parents could not imagine this girl marrying this man, but the parents explained they were not racism, it's because they could not understand the culture in Kenya and they didn't want their girl to suffer, which I understood. And therefore, they married and they got through a lot of problems. And I don't understand why the parent accepted the marriage and they could not assist this couple to settle because the guy was not working, he was just repairing the laptops and this girl had to actually sell Mandazi. Mandazi is like patty without meat inside. Deep fried, fra, kneaded and shaped and deep fried. So she could sell Mandazi on the streets of Kisumu so that they can survive. And actually she has been doing this work so that she can actually sustain the family, buy food, pay rent and so on. Do you think this was a great sacrifice for the white girl. And also, why are the parents? I don't want to actually uh, talk so much about the parents because maybe they said if these are in love, then they should work their way up in their marriage. So, this is the story of Ralph, of two people that are not of the same race, but they actually fought for their love and they got married, it doesn't matter how, or how many struggles they're facing in life, but in the long run, they can make it. They can actually start a hotel with those mandazi and actually do something that will uplift them. So guys, that was my story, and you can comment down below what you think about this story, and I'll appreciate. See you during the next video. Bye-bye, and God bless.